Hello, good afternoon. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you in this excellent, wonderful village, and it's very exciting. I see people hacking things on the back, and we're going to talk about the legal implication of this. My name is Amita Lazari. I'm a doctoral law candidate with Berkeley Law and a CLTC grantee. Here with me, Jamie. And I'm a staff attorney at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and I am on our civil liberties team and do a lot of work with the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which we'll be talking about today. Cool. And as you might have heard, I'm Israeli. That's the accent. So in true Israeli fashion, I want to start with a direct question. How many of you here know this guy? None? Nobody? Okay. This is Kevin Finster. He's a respected security res researcher that found a vulnerability in one of DJI drone systems, a vulnerability that, according to reports, leaked personal information of their consumers. Now, although he has tons of hair, Kevin wanted to wear the white hat. He wanted to report the vulnerability to DJI in their newly just launched bug bounty program. Now, when this program was launched, it wasn't launched with a clear scope or term. So Kevin contacted DJI, and according to reports, in fact, DJI authorized that the vulnerability he found was in scope. Not only that, my friends, they offered him $30,000 for that bug. That's a lot of money for you bug hunters here in the room. That is considered very high. But then the plot thickened. DJI also wanted Kevin to sign an agreement that he found was one-sided, one that left him exposed. And when he refused, according to reports, they threatened him with legal action under the notorious Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Well, how does the story end? Kevin ended up walking away from a $30,000 approved bounty. That's right, my friends, a new Tesla. Let's take a moment to appreciate that lesson, Tesla. And this is a wake-up call for all of us here. Legal threats are on the rise. We hear more about security researchers, even reporters, that are being threatened with respect to issues concerning security research and vulnerabilities. In fact, this is such a huge topic that the Center for Democracy and Technology, CDT, just asked 50 experts to sign a letter, basically going to the community and telling everybody th that we need to address this now. The chilling effects are creating an atmosphere of anonymously disclosing full disclosure vulnerability instead of working together in coordinated disclosure. Not only that, they conducted an interview with 20 leading security researchers. Half of those researchers suggested that the DMCA, copyright law, and we're going to talk about the DMCA, and the CFAA, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, the main two federal anti-hacking laws, have basically uh, undermined their research in a certain way. There were concerns with respect to those laws that affected their research. One researcher even said that he avoided implicating a CFA claim when researching a vehicle. So this is our, these are real relevant concerns and we need to address it now, even when it comes to bug bounties or vulnerability disclosure programs that are used to be considered quite safe. So this is a legal talk and a terms of use talk, and in true terms of use fashion, we have a disclaimer. Although we are lawyers, I'm not admitted in the United States, and you're, we are not yet your lawyers. Uh, you can definitely talk with the FF about them becoming your lawyers, but this is not legal advice. So let's take a deep dive to what we're going to talk today here. All right, let's see. All right, so there's good lawyers in the world, like us, and then there's crafty lawyers, and they use the, we, the these are the tools that we're going to talk about today that these lawyers use um, for companies to go after security research. 
So the first is the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which is a criminal law that has a civil enforcement provision. Um, very vague, passed in 1986. We'll talk about that more. Also, state anti-hacking laws, which are very similar to the CFA. The DMCA and its security exemption. Contracts, in terms of service EULAs. And um, con the Consumer Review Fairness Act, we're going to go over as well. In addition to wiretap laws. All right, wait. Um, so for one example, this is Nest's terms of service. Um, people are, I think, hacking on Nest in the back and we wonder if they've read these terms of service. But um, for instance, if you breach a terms of service and that could be a contact contract violation or get you into trouble with the CFA. One very common restriction is this restriction here. Um, against modifying, making derivative works of, disassembling, reverse compiling, or reverse engineering any part of a, soft of a software product. Um, and then there's also here a, a limit on disclosure. So not just, um, not just what it, the security research that's prohibited, but also actually disclosing it. And this, this doesn't necessarily apply. So if you, even if it didn't constitute hacking, it could, you could get in trouble under this disclosure provision. Yeah, so this is really interesting. This is a new development. If you look at this language here, they suggest that even the performance that is going right there in the back, the analysis on the basically security practices of the devices, you need their consent before you go disclose it to any third party. Now, here there is a new development. This is a new law. We still don't have much clearance because the courts or the FTC have yet to weigh on this. So this is still emerging. But this suggests that actual security researchers as consumers of products should be able to communicate as like a review, right? What are the actual implications of the product, what are the assessments of the performance of the product, and contracts that try to limit such disclosure that is important for transparency for consumers are not allowed, are prohibited. So this is a new thing to look at. Uh, what's interesting here that they do not allow disclosing potentially dam damaging computer code. So you need to think about the limitation of the proof of concept that you're publishing. How are you going into depth about allowing others to reproduce this? Probably not a good idea. Again, this is a law that is just emerging and something to look at. But while this is a new law, unfortunately, the CFAA is, or the DMCA are not new at all. They were enacted in a very early, early stage before the internet as we know it. So let's hear ab more about those main anti-hacking laws. All right, so I want to talk first about the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. And as I mean, mentioned, this is a 1986 statute originally. Um, Congress was trying to go after serious computer break-ins and actually cited to war games in a Senate report. Um, and, but back then, of course, I mean, maybe even still, Congress doesn't necessarily always understand how computers work um, and had a, tr had a little bit of trouble defining what they were um, trying to get at. So they criminalized intentionally accessing a computer without authorization or in excess of authorization. And the term, def the statute defines exceeding authorization, but it refers back to without authorization. So the key terms of the statute are without, with authorization and then without authorization. Where is the line between those two? And the statute doesn't define that. Um, there's other sections of the law. This is just one of them. This is the broadest section and the language has to be interpreted the same through every section. It also prohibits unauthorized damage, which is a separate provision um, of the law. And courts have been confused about what this language means. So there's a, currently a circuit split. Um, at first, courts were interpreting terms of service violations or actually employment contracts. So it, it, computer use restrictions that your employer would place on you. They were interpreting violations of those or duties of loyalty to your, em to your employer. So as if you accessed a computer for non-work purposes, you were breaching your duty of loyalty and therefore violating the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act by accessing this computer without authorization. These are older cases. 
that interpretation of the law, of course, taken to its end is, okay, so if I lie about my age on Facebook, is that a computer fraud and abuse act violation? And actually, the government tried to go after a woman for lying about her age on, um, in a MySpace profile back in the day. And kind of ever since that case, especially, the constitutional issues of this being a completely broad and insane statute have been kind of more apparent to courts. So courts started going the other way. And the Ninth Circuit interpreted the law um, narrowly in a case called Nozzle, United States versus Nozzle. And in that case, the court said that no, terms of service violations, computer use restrictions, those are not, uh, violating computer use restrictions does not constitute a computer fraud and abuse act violation. It's not without authorization according to what Congress was intending. Um, but violated an access restriction, which the court characterized as circumventing technological access barriers, was a CFA violation. And so other courts started following that, the Fourth Circuit, the Second Circuit. Um, but then there was a couple of interesting password sharing cases with kind of bad facts. So this is Nozzle 2 and Power Ventures. And these cases kind of threw a wrench in this whole circuit split situation because they were password sharing. They weren't really hacking. And in both cases, um, the person who accessed the computer was using the password with the valid consent and authorization, valid credentials with, with permission. In Power Ventures, it involved a, um, a social media aggregator who was basically scraping information and putting it all in a different place for users who wanted to um, go to one place and check multiple social media accounts. And um, Facebook didn't like that, so they sued them under the CFAA. Nozzle 2, which is a, the second version of the first Nozzle case, involved um, an employee giving her password to somebody else who came in and sold some trade secrets. Um, trade secrets definitely covered it, so the court didn't need to go out and reach it. Facebook could have sued Power Ventures for intentional interference with, um, co or with economic relations or business relations, but instead they went after it under the CFAA. And the, ca the courts somehow found a way to contort the law in a very confusing way. I personally don't think the opinions are consistent with Nozzle 1, which is an en banc decision, um, which it should have been consistent with. So this has created a lot of confusion. The court said in Nozzle 2, you know, you can't, if you're not the computer owner, you can't even give authorization, which is pretty confusing because people share passwords all the time. The dissent recognized there was no difference um, between password sharing in that case and normal password sharing. Not that you should share passwords. Don't share passwords. Um, and then in Power Ventures, the court said that Facebook users had given the company authorization, but when Facebook sent a cease and desist letter saying you are no longer authorized and they violated the cease and desist letter, that was a Computer Fraud and Abuse Act violation. And so now companies are trying to use this law actually um, to go after, to actually go after like companies for scraping online in the public, in publicly available data context. So um, it's becoming an anti-competitive tool and then as, if they interpret it super broadly, of course it's gonna be an anti-security researching tool. And in fact, the ACL, oh, this is, a, this is an old 2010 um, computer crime manual from the DOJ which talks about it's relatively easy to prove that a defendant had only limited authority to access a computer such as when they violate a terms of service. They have since, the government has since watched back from prosecuting these cases, but companies are still doing it and they def the way that these cases are interpreted in civil context applies equally in the criminal context. Which is why people are so scared when you see this in a terms of, or in a cease and desist letter, or a threat letter. So it, in, we have one good case recently though, out of a district court in DC, security researchers um, and The Intercept, represented by the ACLU, brought a case against the government, arguing that um, the Constitution was, or the, <laughs> that the CFA violated the First Amendment, violated the Constitution because it was unconstitutionally vague and, um, blocked their constitutionally protected security researchers, research. And in that case, the court actually narrowly interpreted the CFA to avoid the constitutional issue and found that um, scraping or using automated tools, that's, you can access that information anyway. It's not hacking to use technology to help you get information that you already can, even when the terms of service prohibits it. And so 
employing a bot to crawl a website or apply for jobs may run afoul of a website's terms of service, but it does not constitute an access violation when the human who creates the bot is otherwise allowed to read and interact with that site. And they actually, the website, the court actually quoted Star Wars as well in the decision, which what, which is makes it extra cool. Yeah. So what we're seeing here with IQ, which is another very important scraping decision, at still, still basically in litigation and or argument with the Ninth Circuit, and this Sandvik decision there might be a future for our bots. So in public facing infrastructure, the idea that you're gonna use terms of use or even technological measures like IP blocking to limit the way researchers, companies, competitors, algorithmic auditors that are often engaged in scraping in order to uncover bias and deception in black box algorithms, um, all of these people are going to be greatly, greatly influenced, and all of us, by those two main decisions basically progressing right now, IQ in the Ninth Circuit and Sandvik in the DC Circuit. So let's say a future for bots. Let me add one thing. Um, I also just wanted to quickly mention, because you mentioned IP address blocks, that it is our position at EFF that an IP address block is not a technological access barrier because it does not keep anyone out. Um, that's an issue that's coming up in these cases and companies are trying to argue that it does. So that's one issue to watch. So, and this is um, extremely interesting because in the argument we just, we saw in the oral argument in IQ, the lawyer saying, wait, is it, a, is it in fact a te technological measure if it's just slowing me down and not actually preventing me to access? So great point on that. But the CFAA is not alone in the land of anti-hacking laws, especially for you guys out there in the back and for IoT hacking, for car hacking, for all of these devices that have embedded security, the DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, an amendment to the copyright law, is a very important anti-hacking law. So this is a federal law with criminal and civil liability, most, mostly civil. And it basically prohibits circumvention of technological measures that effectively control, and this is one of the components of, of this clause, the access to software code as copyright protect protected work. Now the question is, do we actually need copyright infringement when we evaluate the circumvention and whether the DMCA was violated? Now here we have murkiness and a split. There are some decisions that suggest that if you are circumventing for the purpose of basically establishing interoperability, so jailbreakings, etc., uh, the DMCA should not be an issue, but when it comes to media and videos, etc., courts have been more willing to think that you don't have a really close relationship to copyright infringement. So this is the Lexmark decision, one example, versus the Blizzard decision for those of you writing citations. Now, the courts and the regulator and the Congress recognize it, is that this is a law that might not keep up with technology. Exactly like the CFA, this is a law from 98 that was basically inspired by big entertainment companies seeking to prevent piracy. So in order to make sure that the law keeps up with technology, we actually have some statutory exemption for security testing and encryption. But as you can see, they have tons of requirements for security testing you need authorization from the owner. Yeah, I'm sure that it, that person is gonna let you hack their product. We actually have empirical research showing that when people try to get authorization, they were either often refused or even got threat letters back. So the statutory exemptions are murky in extent because they have tons of requirements and it's not clear what is the weight of each requirement. We also have a temporary good faith security. So I talk about the law basically being at risk of not keeping up with technology and basically stifling new developments. So we do have a process that basically every three years the copyright office is engaged in this multi-stakeholder discussion to figure out what kind of carve-outs, what kind of safe harbor and exemption we need to create from that very broad anti-hacking law. And one of those 
exemption from 2015 and now pending renewal, probably going to be renewed at very final process, um, is the temporary good faith security exemption that doesn't require the authorization like the statutory exemption. But guess what? You thought that it's going to be free and broad? No, we do have tons of limitation. So first of all, we have a device limitation. Right now, as it's written, it's geared towards devices that are basically designed to be used by individual consumer. So let me ask you, an elevator versus Nest device? What about commercial printers, right? So this is v quite vague. We, but this also includes voting machines, by the way. So our friends right here, the voting hacking machine village, great job. The DMCA security exemption was really important for that. This also includes motorized land vehicles, car hacking village friends, yes. They also rely on that to some extent and medical devices in certain circumstances. But this is only one requirement. Guess what? You need to lawfully acquire the machines. So our friends here in the IoT Village probably got their machines from Nest. That's great. You need to lawfully acquire the machine. Then you also need to only be engaging in your research for the purpose of good faith security research, not violate any other law. And this is the real main issue because as we will show you, there is a relationship between the laws. So for example, if my nest comes with the terms of use, and I'm violating the terms of use because I'm hacking, you saw our anti-hacking language before? I'm violating that contract. Do I get the DMCA exemption or not? Because now I'm risking a CFAA and other law violations. So this is a very important component that there is a lot of debate right now. And basically, we are, there are a lot of people requiring, requesting that this will be removed. Then the researcher, not only that, should be conducted in a controlled environment. Is this a controlled environment, etc.? So the idea here, there are plenty of requirements as well, and we are not trying to redo them, remove some of them. In fact, the Department of Justice itself weighed on this issue, and they suggested in their comments that there is an issue with the limitation on security research exemption only for primarily designed for consumer devices, so we might see this removed. And also they just uh, suggest that this idea that everything should be in a lab-like environment is not realistic and it's not what we need. That's not how products are being used in reality. So whatever is going to go with the DMCA temporary and good faith security exemption is going to be really, really important for all you IoT hackers, uh, so stay tuned. Now, I mentioned bug bounty in the, in the beginning is because there is another aspect here, which is the relationship between the CFAA, the DMCA, and believe it or not, bug bounty contract terms. So this is my own project, Legal Bug Bounty. And the relationship basically is dependent on that clause you just saw that suggested that violating the CFAA contract law might undermine the DMCA security exemption. So by show of hands here in the room, who here heard about the bug bounty, ever visited a page like this or a vulnerability reward program? Yeah, we have some hunters in the room. That's cool. Well, this is on the rise. Um, not only bug bounties, only vulnerability, also vulnerability disclosure programs. And one reason is that regulators are actually pushing that, and that includes IoT regulators like the FDA um, and NHTSA. In fact, the FTC has written just two months ago, if I'm not mistaken, in one document, that they think that failure to maintain our process to get security vulnerability from the community and addressing them is in fact unreasonable under the FTC Act. This means that we're gonna see more and more companies coming to you, coming to us, coming to everybody, and setting at place at least a vulnerability disclosure program, a communication channel. And the language of that program, that contract is gonna be also very important. Why? I'm not sure that anyone here perhaps encountered this piece of bug bounty terms. So these are bug bounties, not vulnerability disclosure program, although they also have legal terms. But what's funny is there are a lot of terms of use in bug bounties. And often we ignore the legal part of a bug bounty and we just focus on the technical scope. 
but this spot could actually create liability. So what am I talking about? I actually conducted the research and I read hundreds of terms. And what I found was, in some cases, pretty conflicting stuff. For, for example, this is AVG bug bounty terms. They suggest that when you submit the bug, you also agree to the EULA the end user license agreement that it is geared towards users. And guess what? That EULA has the same anti-hacking language that we just saw. No spoofing, no attempt to gain unauthorized access, no hacking. So this combination between the bank bounty terms and the EULA creates civil and criminal potential liability. It shifts the risk to the hacker. Now these are taking away the terms. So you should be careful in reading them and addressing them and knowing what's at stake. This is just one example. To kind of summarize this point from what I saw, there are a lot of cases where companies are actually shifting the risk to the hacker. Now this is not, as we saw, this is not just contractual liability. This is CFIA liability and DMCA liability because it's all boiling down to authorization. So piece of good news, uh, I don't know if anyone here knows Ed Overflow. Um, but we are working together on standardizing safe harbors and legal language for bug bounties. This is my own project, Legal Bug Bounty. You can check it out. And in fact, we had um, some developments. Background is now launched Disclose IOs in collaboration with me. Background is a hacker platform basing, creating almost like open source or one type of language people can adopt. Bug Bounty and Vulnerability Disclosure, Pro disclosure Program can adopt in order to make sure they don't put the crowd, the hackers, at risk. So check that out. It's called Disclose.io. And we did have some success, and I really want to give a shout out here for Dropbox adding an explicit safe harbor in the bug bounty from the CFAA and the DMCA, and Mozilla, yes, my friends, the pioneer of bug bounties this month. Uh, basically um, launching a new safe harbor in the bug bounty. So slowly we're going to see this uh, type of language in bug bounties and VDP with respect to authorization and waiver of, of potential claims against the researcher. Now this is key. You need to be at the lookout because this affects your liability. If a company has that type of language in their contract, you are probably safer than in the case that they don't have it, right? Because basically when they authorize access and if you are staying in scope, you are like a pen tester. The legal foundation of the claim is negated. So this is another part of the conversation. Um, and I have my own project where I actually list all the companies with safe harbors and you can check it that out. Uh, just to finalize that note, a final comment on wiretaps, and I'm not going to get into the weeds of this too much, but I'm happy to say that this is actually one of my own projects. We just presented it at the Crypto, crypto Village. Uh, we conducted an at scale audit on Android apps that included a lot of security testing, let's put it that way. Um, and one of the concerns, one of the actual comments that we got from the reviewers, and I have my co-author in here in the room, Parmal, shout out for him, um, was, are, is there a potential wiretap problem here? So let me explain what was the issue. We created basically a, stalker, a cluster, a database of 6,000 apps from Google Play Store, and we created an infrastructure where we basically look at all on the network analysis, but in order to do a dynamic analysis at scale, we actually needed to quote unquote play the apps. What we wanted to see is what is being collected from a data perspective each and every moment the app is basically being interacting with the user. But instead of having real users interacting at six, with 6,000 apps all the time, that's impossible, right? We had to, to automate the, the process. So we use something that is called a monkey, an exerciser, basically a software that is acting like a user and touching the interface. Bottom line, what was interesting here, that the wiretap claim wasn't relevant because our communication wasn't human at all. The person, so-called quote-unquote person interacting, the network that was basically monitored wasn't created by any human, but 
our software, our monkey. So when you're basically um, doing IoT testing, wiretap is also important. Make sure, especially if it's speakers, um, um, uh, Google Home and the like, that you don't have other people in the room that you are listening to or others that you didn't obtain their consent to. Wiretap is another thing to be on the lookout. So I want to wrap it up and I need to Jamie to think, to talk about a little bit of actual practical recommendations that we have for you people here in the room. All right, so as Amit mentioned, one thing you could do is ask for permission, but that definitely doesn't always work and it's not always an option. But one of the first things you need to do is be aware. So are there terms of service? What do they say? Read them. Um, and also, if there's a bug bounty program, read those terms. And if you get a cease and desist letter or someone saying you're not authorized to do something, um, just be aware that that could be a red flag for the CFAA. It's good to just know what laws that they're using, know how they're interpreted, know that there's a circuit split and you might be at issue because then you can know one other thing that you can ask EFF. So who all knows what EFF is or who EFF is? Whoa, not everybody. So we are a digital rights nonprofit. We've been around since 1990, and we have a coder's rights program where people come to us with security research questions. We represent in consulting basis and give advice about what to do, what not to do, if the research already happened, what's, what legal risks are, and things like that. So it's free. So that's one thing that I definitely want everyone to take away from is come ask us if you have any questions. Uh, we're happy to help. Also, CDT, another nonprofit, so the Center for Democracy and Technology, posts recommendations online that are, can be really useful. Another thing to do is use your own computers and accounts and your own devices rather than your neighbors without their permission. Devices that you are definitely they are authorized to use, accounts that you're definitely authorized to use. Um, that doesn't always work in some cases. For instance, under the CFAA, if you're accessing a server or doing anything on the cloud, you're accessing someone else's computer, um, and therefore this won't necessarily protect you. But offline testing could help. So if you get, if you're downloading things and doing things on your own system, then you're not accessing anyone else's computer. Um, also, minimizing interactions with users' data and also second-hand devices, which helps with the first sale doctrine. So if you're entering into uh, buying a phone, you have a terms of service agreement with the, with the phone company. Like I said, it's not the but, but, but if you sell the device, it's not necessarily, I don't have, you don't have the same contractual relationship. And then again, bug bounty. Wait, what is this? Yeah, I'm going to add on that. Sorry, late addition, but um, maybe news flash to the audience here in the room. Um, so Bounty Factory is a European bug bounty. They're really cool. And recognizing that this landscape isn't perfect, they actually created a tool to report vulnerabilities via Thor. I haven't tried it, but just wanted to let you know I heard it was used in some circumstances. The idea is basically minimize your risk. Uh, I am hoping that we will get to a point that there will, no, there will not be any question or whether if you're engaging in a coordinated disclosure and trying to work with a company under a VDP, there are, there are no risk of legal threats, but this is not our case yet. Uh, so this is with respect to that. And also important with respect to bank bounties is with respect to basically what are the lines when it comes to dem demonstrating impact? So again, the idea is if you see users' data, that's a very, very, very hard stop. Even if you want to show the impact of your vulnerability in a bank bounty, you should be very mindful of what is the proof of concept that you are producing and communicate basically with the program owner if there is any doubt. We see a lot of tension and kind of in, in, uh, vagueness around that issue of where does the line stop when it comes to proof of concept. If you want to hear more about bank bounty, I'm doing a legal bank bounty talk tomorrow at SkyDocs at free. So finally, we want to give you some takeaways, some websites you can check out. So we have here the EFF website and the Coder Rights Project. Do you want to say something about that? Uh, sure. Well, I already talked about the Coder's Rights Project. We also have a website online with lots of blog posts about all sorts of things, which is a really great resource. We also have a booth in the vendor area if you want to come ask any questions. And if you want to contact the Coder's Rights Program, I should say email info at EFF.org, and we will help you. 
Yeah, and uh, Legal Bank Bounty, you can check out my project, CDT report that I just mentioned. That is a really cool report, um, basically coming from their interviews with 20 lead leading researchers. They have a bunch of recommendations there. They also explain the law. Check it out. That's, here's the link. You can check it out on CDT and just Google it on their website. And if you want to have a general C CFA overview, there are great talks by Leonard Bailey and others on YouTube, there is also this great overview document. The main idea is be mindful, consider learning more about this issue. Yes, the situation is not perfect, but we're doing what we can to deal with it, especially Jamie here, who is doing amazing, amazing work. Uh, that's it. I want to end with a very kind of good note and a, a kind of final hopeful story to the CFA mess. You remember Kevin, our guy? The last of 30,000 bounty? Well, guess what? Although DJI threatened him with the suit later thereafter, they added an explicit safe harbor to their bug bounty policy, communicating to the security researchers that they will not pursue legal action. And the point here, this community has tons of power. It's not just the law, it's also reputational, issues that will basically come hunt you if you threaten a researcher. And we have a lot of power to change stuff. Stay tuned, be involved, ask questions. Uh, we are here and that's it. Thank you so much. Uh, and follow also the IOT bill. This is not law yet, but it has a CFA and DMCA safe harbor. This is work by I'm the Cavalier is doing amazing work. This is also kind of a positive uh, final note to fo to end with. Okay, we are here for your questions. If we have a bit more time, I think we do.